So thank you, everyone. Thank you for attending my talk. I hope you had a good lunch. It was good food, as promised. So thank you uh, to the committee for getting that, that done. Today's talk is about uh, building uh, scalable and resilient event-driven applications. So in recent years, event-driven architecture has been popular for building real-time and scalable applications. Uh, and Apache Pulsar is a distributed pub, mes pub sub messaging system that's well suited for this use case. And I'll walk through this example in a minute. Uh, using Pulsar functions as our sort of distributed processing framework on top of that that makes that all go together. Stream Native is a company I work for. My name is David Karamgard. I'm a developer advocate for them. And every time this does this, okay, there we go. A little bit about me. I'm a committer on the Apache Pulsar project. Uh, I've been working, you know, at, I've worked at Splunk's internal team as Pulsar as a service. Uh, before that in the big data space with Hortonworks and a lot of different things for over the past 15 years. Uh, there's my employers from A to Z, Amazon to Zappos. I generally have a hard time keeping a job down, so I have lots of these uh, going around. I get I get bored and go on other things. In my spare time, when I have these things, I like to write books. I don't know why it doesn't pay anything, but it's just fun way to capture your knowledge and share with others. Uh, I've entirely written Pulsar in Action by Manning Press. It's available for free. Download the entire copy PDF version if you go to streamnative.io resources ebooks. I think it's there. Just put in your information, and you get that book for free. I also was able to fortunate enough to co-author part of Practical Hive on query optimization with the Apache Hive distributed uh, query engine uh, as well. So let's talk about event-driven architecture, right? Event-driven applications are designed to respond to events or changes in real time, driving actions and triggering different processes, right? So what is, that's what event-driven architecture is. Um, you know, it's really designed for, uh, you know, different, different way of processing data. Usually you have these stateful processing data. You get an event happens in your system. You persist it to a database. That's a snapshot of a point in time. Uh, and you communicate either through having structured, you know, G -G GPCR, you know, all these different remote protocol things or use an API or things like that, a microservices, communicate with them one another, or you call the same programming language to interact with these microservices. Event-driven architecture is designed that it's completely decoupled. I send a message out. Uh, systems later on can come and process at their point in time. An event represents a change of state. Something happened, an order was placed, a, a temperature sensor was read, something like that. Something happened, uh, and you need to respond to it, right? So it's designed for highly scalable and asynchronous architecture, right? I send it out. I don't care about it. I detect the event. When I get the event, I want, on my, my side as a processor, I process it as I see fit. Uh, you know, at a high level, you're really breaking down into very simple language. You have message producers, message consumers, and somewhere in between a message broker that makes it all happen, right? I, something, an event comes out from one of these different sources, uh, one of these event producers, uh, and you guarantee that it gets routed to one of these, you know, uh, consuming microservice, web application, Pulsar function, uh, things like that. You just want to get this information shared between the two, right? So this is just a very, very simple way of breaking the world down uh, from that. And really the core being the event routers in between. That's that's the key. Everybody can generate an event. I created a little language API. Something happens, I measure it, I capture the data, I collect the data. The routers are what make the magic happen. Uh, and they have these, they really require some of these basic capabilities between these two. So pub sub is one, as I mentioned before, I really need to get the people and guarantee, publish the message to those who want to receive it, guarantee that they get it, they acknowledge they got the message, that sort of thing, which is different. Uh, it's a different semantic and supported by things like Apache Kafka thus far. They're working on messaging. Again, I know there's a confluent person here. Don't know. <laughs> But then Kafka handles that. Message routing, obviously, is the key. I want to get this message routed to certain people at a certain point in time. It goes to individual topics, individual, uh, maybe consumers on a partition, things like that, so I can get the data to exactly who it needs, where it needs to go. That's the key part of an event router. And then, obviously, ability to queue up messages, right? Uh, microservices, microservices can be offline for a while. I need to queue up this information, all these events that occurred. So that they can get processed reliably and reliably and nothing gets lost in between, right? And so if you queue up these messages for a while, you can, you have your event-driven architecture uh, and all those three co concepts works. And that's what event routers need to do. So I, I'm proposing here, obviously being a little self-serving, Apache Pulsar is the message router you want to use. It's a great uh, technological solution for that. I talked about a little bit in my first talk, but I'll share it again. So Pulsar is a pub sub uh, system. It's designed to be pub sub from day one. Uh, and it's horizontally scalable, right? So you have the concepts of producers come in, you publish your topics. Topics is where you put the data uh, completely decoupled. Consumers on the other side subscribe to the to topics. They get the information back. They receive the data whenever the publisher gets it. And each consumer has its own offset. It's, it's point in time of where it consumed the messages, what, what data has, has it produced or has it consumed and what messages hasn't it consumed. Uh, so all interactions go through this uh, broker layer in between for Apache Pulsar. So I've broken out just two of the four uh, 
subscription types that Apache Pulsar works uh, has its total of four, but I focused in on the two that support queuing and routing specifically, right? And so for, you have really two different consumption patterns in the pub sub model. One is the exclusive one. I want a copy of every single message on this topic. So again, it's like the original, think of it as a, you know, subscription. I, back in the days when you would get something delivered in the mail or like a newspaper, every day you have a subscription. I get a new, new I get my copy of the newspaper every day. It's mine. My neighbor gets his own copy and so on and so forth. That's the exclusive one. Every consumer uh, gets every particular copy of that message. You, and if a second consumer tries to come in and interject and say, I want some of these messages, you just say, no, they're rejected. The other one is the shared consumer or shared subscription model. This is your traditional work queue, right? So it's competing consumers model. I can have as many consumers on that individual subscription on that topic as I want. As you can see here, the messages are sort of distributed uh, across those individual consumers. There's no real, real particular reason. If you have one that's consuming faster than the other, it will consume more. If you have a lagging consumer, it will get less but it's controlled by the acknowledgement. So consumer gets a message, it processes it, it sends an acknowledgement back, it says I'm done, then it's ready for the next message in that process. So that supports your work queue semantics, which is what you need for event-driven architecture. So from a messaging semantics perspective, Pulsar covers your pub sub capabilities that are required for event-driven architecture. So that's that's my proposal. That's a crazy thing is where the message broker is, put in, put in Apache Pulsar. It's an ideal candidate for this. It serves a use case very well. Uh, it solves some of the other latency issues and horizontal scalability issues that traditional message brokers did like RabbitMQ. Uh, they're not horizontally scalable. They have message retention limitations because of the way that they store data on physical disks. I map them to brokers. They don't scale horizontally unless you shard, do some sharding and some magic behind, in front of the scenes to make them really work. So Pulsar is horizontally scalable. It solves these problems, build it once, and you're done with it. So now that hopefully I've convinced you to say, well, that's okay. This Pulsar thing is cool for message broker, but that's, maybe that's not enough. Maybe I'm happy with RabbitMQ. I'd like to also say that the second thing that Pulsar brings to the table that makes event-driven architecture easier and simpler is our, the, our lightweight compute framework called Pulsar Functions. So Pulsar Functions are really just lightweight computing infrastructure that run on top of Pulsar. Use Pulsar as, a, as an intermediate, intermediary to save data in between the between the different systems and you can have them run in different uh, modes. So you can run them, have them run as threads on a broker. You can run them have them run the individual processes on a, what we call function workers or dedicated machines for running these functions. Or the more interesting one that I'm gonna show you here is Kubernetes, right? So you can write these individual pieces of code, have it run on Kubernetes uh, on that. So it's really it's a really simple specification for that. You can write individual pieces of code that implement one method and one method only. So if you're familiar with like AWS lambdas or things like that, it's, it's designed for low entry, uh, you know, sort of into the system, right? You want to do complex event processing. Okay, you stand up a Flink cluster, you stand up a Spark cluster. That's a lot of overhead for doing a lot of these simple message transformations and things like that, right? So you can do a lot of these, uh, you can do some processing logic on a per message basis uh, without having to stand up all this infrastructure to do it. And how it works is it's, you know, it's a, it's a reactive under the covers. It's sort of, you know, as a message comes in, it reacts to the event, a bit of code gets, you know, invoked, right? So we'll talk about the API here in a minute, but basically this is the programming model. So you can say for my Pulsar function, when I deploy it, configure it, I want to listen to all these different topics. Uh, they could have similar message structures, uh, different schemas, things like that. When, when, any, when any, an event comes in on one of these, my Pulsar function method, the individual message method that you implement gets invoked, takes that message inputs, fed into it automatically. And then you can process, do some processing on that data. You can optionally, output data to another topic. If you return a value, it publishes it to a downstream topic, or you can do something internal like update a database to whatever sort of things you want. And you can optionally, you know, optionally write to a log. You can implement some internal counters. Uh, there can be support metrics as well. So you want to monitor an instrument, your functions with a dashboard to see, you know, what's my workflow and things like that. You can also do those sorts of things. So it's really just a simple piece of code uh, that gets triggered automatically uh, from messages arriving inside a Pulsar topic. So again, this is this is it. This is the simple API. If, if, if you uh, go to one uh, computer science course your freshman year, you'd be able to write something like that. Apologize for what that noise was. Uh, this is it. This is your complete API that you have to implement, right? Function, you specify the input type of your schema, the message coming in. If you're going to return one, you specify what the type is going to be going out. And then you have a single method you have to implement. So very, very easy to do. That context object, the second parameter in that has gives you access to a lot of different capabilities. I won't go through all of them here, but you can, uh, you know, publish it to different topics than the one you intended to. Again, that's where how you record metrics, record logs, 
uh, you know, generate brand new messages on that, do content-based routing, all sorts of use cases are there, but it's a really simple bit for this. And so if you want to write some different, you know, ED, EDA style programming, an event comes in on a topic, I, 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 I respond to it immediately, do some processing on it. Uh, you can also inc import any third-party library as well. So this is really, just because it's a simple interface doesn't mean you can't do powerful things. Uh, and you, you bundle it up inside an artifact and you can bundle whatever AI programming model you want to use with it. You can use uh, data, again, database libraries, whatever you want to move data around between the two. So those are functions. Those are pulsar functions, individual pieces of code. They're pretty cool. But if you're going to build anything of substance, you start having lots of these, you know, one or two or three, you start building like data processing pipelines. You can start thinking of it as an ETL pipeline. Event comes in, maybe I do a lookup, enrich the data, have a different value coming out. I persist it to a database. I do some additional things. I go get this. So you start having the, to start stitching these things together, right? So it's really a way, a function mesh, which is an open source Kubernetes operator, uh, is a way of deploying lots of these individual Pulsar functions as a whole application unit themselves. So you say, my application is really a mesh of these five functions. Those input topics go from here to there. Uh, you know, I'm routing the data between the two. And then if I want to spin them down or spin them up, I can do that dynamically as well. And it use a lot, utilizes a Kubernetes scheduler under the cover. Covers, as we'll see here, to also add the uh, scalability uh, on set, concept to it. We'll, we'll talk about this a little bit. So Pulsar functions, these individual pieces of codes themselves can sense. Uh, we'll show with these metrics that, hey, I'm using a lot of CPU and maybe I'm falling behind or I'm using a lot of memory. I need to spin some more up and we'll show how that happens automatically here in a minute. But the Kubernetes, a function message is a Kubernetes operator that makes all that possible, right? So it's just a uh, different API. Again, you can basically, once you submit a CRD, you just define a CRD. Uh, you use the cube cuddle tool to just say apply. I want to deploy this function. It has a specific layout of what your function mesh looks like uh, using some particular verbs. And I'll give you some examples here in a minute. And that's how you deploy your uh, functions. And then obviously you can hook that into like Argo CD and these other development pipelines. So you update your pulsar, uh, your function code, maybe add a new function to it, check it back in and Argo CI CD does the rest, deploys it out to your Kubernetes uh, environment and just continues to run. Uh, we also support, I didn't mention here, but we also have IO connector sources and syncs that are sort of predefined ones as well. So I want to read data from a Debezium CDC connector. That's considered a function as well. You can deploy that as well, sync it to like an S3 bucket. Uh, you can do that as well and do some processing in between. A little bit about this, it mainly consists of, so the, uh, you know, function mesh internal mainly consists of two components. One's the Kubernetes operator that watches the function mesh CRCDs and creates Kubernetes resources uh, to run functions, uh, stateful sets. Uh, basically, uh, the other one is the function runner that invokes the functions and connectors logic when receiving events from these input streams. So again, your event driven architecture, these events come into the topics. That's how you're passing through this function runner uh, indicate, picks that up and then triggers the processing of these events. Uh, the, the runner it supports different languages. So you can do Pulsar functions in Java. You can do them in Python. You can do them in Go. Uh, we're in the process of building a uh, generic runtime for multiple different languages. That's going to be coming out here shortly, but right now those are the ones that you can write functions in. And logically, like I said before, you sort of think of it like this. So I have data coming in from one source. That's my connector. I have a like a source connector. I'm going to send it through a different Pulsar function over here, different function over there, join these results back together into a sync, and then write it out somewhere else. It's just one, one of the many different use cases. And that can be your whole, you know, EDA sort of pipeline, an event comes in on a topic, I want to do different things, I want to hand it off to this one, this one, this one. Uh, again, like an order comes in, that's an order event, I have different microservices instead that do one, do you know, do you know, do fulfillment, do tax collection, do payment, do processing all triggered by an event, and then they have to happen in a sequence, sequential order, and that can happen through a mesh. So this blob of YAML is sort of an example of what a mesh definition is. Don't get too caught up into it. It's pretty straightforward. You can see that the basic languages here are functions. It's a kind of function mesh. And then inside of me have different functions. Uh, each one's have, you know, unique class names and what my image is and the number of replicas I can have. Input topics, you can see my output topics if I want. Uh, some different configurations as well, where my artifacts are. Uh, you can also specify the behavior, like auto act, for example, I get a message, always acknowledge it. Uh, sort of thing versus I have to explicitly do it in the code. Again, that's up to you what sort of processing semantics you want to enforce with your uh, architecture. You can specify resource limits, sort of mins and max. We'll see how we play with that for that, for the uh, auto scaling and then uh, minimum and maximum replicas uh, as well, output topics, input topics, log topics, all that, all configurable uh, through a function mesh uh, CRD. And then you can change these again dynamically. So 
So back to the talk promise, the EDA application resiliency and scalability. I'll talk a little bit about how this framework, so Pulsar Function as your event uh, source in between, Pulsar Functions as a framework uh, to write your code for individual ED processing, function mesh to put it all together. So how does this give you all these different things? So we believe with the stateful set, the, the Kubernetes runtime provides the resiliency you need, right? If it, By the fact that we're hooking into the Kubernetes, you run these as pods, you say my minimum replica count is, 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 is at least one, that if it dies for whatever reason, Kubernetes scheduler takes care of getting you up another instance up and running, right? So you don't have to worry about any sort of error handling, worse, you know, out of memory exception, something happens uh, it, it, because you, you're relying on replica sets. That's what they're built for, right? They have one job, ensure that end, end copies of my pod are up and running. So let's just take advantage of that and just lean into that. Uh, and then in the CRDs, you just specify the replica, uh, use that replica to specify how many of these I have to have running. Uh, set this to greater than one for high availability. You know, you don't want to have this latency where it dies, another pod comes up and running. If you use a shared subscription, uh, they can they track that same cursor so you know where they are. Uh, the function mesh is the part that provides the scalability. And that's what I'm going to show a little bit of a demo today where we have built into a Pulsar function mesh framework, this auto scaling capability to sort of detect when, hey, there's something going on with my function is consuming a lot of CPU or a lot of memory using these metrics. Uh, to to do that, but you you can do it old school. You can do it manually. You can go back and say, okay, this is a pod running. I can just scale it up. If you know ahead of time you're going to have a large uh, processing from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., you want to scale it up to some sort of number ahead of time. You can do that manually. Uh, but the function mesh is a real cool part. Uh, it's again, it uses the built-in auto scaler, so you can do either HPA, which is you know just more instances of the same one, or the VPA, which is the vertical pod auto scaler using, uh, and then it's driven by built-in metrics or you can define your own metrics as well. So it, the key part is it has to hook into uh, the Kubernetes metrics server. It's gonna look at those particular metrics in Kubernetes to decide, hey, this is an event I've, I've exceeded a certain threshold and that's where it gets the information from. Uh, just a disclaimer, you can't do both. You can only do one at a time. That's super ambitious to try and do both. Uh, so you can either specify for one versus the other. I would say you pick the VPA in the case where you can't do you can't scale horizontally in the fact that you don't want multiple instances of those mess of those things processing the data in parallel, uh, like exactly once processing. In that case, you want to do something like a VPA, make it bigger. Don't give me more because you'd have end up having duplicate processing of those messages. Uh, and if you don't have a shared subscription type, then you may have may process it twice. So HPA is good for when you're using the shared subscription model I showed you earlier, which is sort of like your work queue, everybody's going to get a subset of messages, but there's no duplicate processing. If you use one of the other uh, subscription types in Pulsar, don't use HPA, use VPA. So this is sort of how, you know, once it's configured up and running, the horizontal pod auto scaler just checks the metrics, these sort of things, and it's given, uh, you know, changes the number of pods uh, basically to, you know, meet the workload while it drops the metrics below your desired threshold. So it's defined as don't let my CPU exceed a certain amount of resources. And it starts by, you know, once it triggers that, it scales them up. And then once your total uh, resources go below that, then it stops scaling them up. Uh, it also scales them back down, which we'll, I'm not sure if I built them in or showed that or not in that recording, but there are some built-in ones. By default, we sort of pick some arbitrary numbers that you can define in our uh, resource definition here that you can say, I just want my average utilization of CPU to be below this. If it exceeds this particular threshold for a certain amount of time, please trigger it automatically. We pick some numbers that seem to work well, 50%, 80%, 20%. Uh, but again, you're not locked into those, but these are the ones that come in natively out of the box. Uh, you can also do uh, specify your own as well. So you can, you know, you, you basically, this is walk you through what you have to do. First thing is to set up your, uh, you know, metric server. You have to have metrics to be a source of truth. If you don't have that, it can't work. That's why I'm doing the demo as a recording, not on my laptop, because Docker doesn't have a metric server in Kubernetes. And surprisingly enough, you try many cubes, doesn't work well on a laptop that already has more than two things running on it. So <laughs> we're sort of limited with a demo. I did this in my home lab. Lab. You set up the horizontal pod autoscaler uh, as well, and then you. To enable it, you set the max replica parameter, which we'll see here in a minute, uh, to be a value different from your min replicas. That says, hey, uh, you're allowed to scale up to this many. You can't scale, you know, you know, infinitely. And then you specify the metric type as a built-in here. And you can specify, and if you don't specify a strategy, which I'll show in the next one, the default is 80%. So going back to CRCD, 
land. This is how it looks. And I highlighted what you have to change in yellow, right? So this is inside your function mesh. You know, this is one of your many lists in your function mesh. This is a function. Uh, that's my name. This is this is all my different, you know, um, class names, things like that. You're basically enabled to enable HPA. You do set up the replicas. And then on the pod itself, you say, I want to use the build-in autoscaler, which uses in the build-in metrics name. And you specify here that I want it to be, you know, 20%. What's my CPU for this, for these pods running this particular function exceed 20%. Uh, I want this to be uh, triggered and automatically scale it up from at least from one up to a maximum of four. Now, if you want to use a custom one, then you can you can you can change it yourself. You're not stuck with that. What if I don't want 20, 20 50 or 80 percent? Those are nice, Dave. But what if I want 45? Uh, then you can do it like this. Right. So, again, the replica count is the same, but then you uh, do this auto scaling metrics. You don't use the build in. You use custom. Uh, you specify your resource that you want to trigger on. Right now, you can do either CPU or memory. Those are your two choices. So I can trigger based on the CPU metrics or the memory metrics. Uh, and then you just def define this percentage of that resource that you want to exceed. So it's very, 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 very easy to make it uh, anywhere from 1 to 100. Uh, you have all your different options, all your choices. So with VPA, it's very similar, but it's done uh, slightly different. So you use the vertical pod autoscaler uh, to increase the resources of the pod themselves. So as we saw in the resource definition, you can say, I want you know X amount of millicores, I want X amount of RAM uh, periodically, but if it, if it starts getting like out of memory, you start getting too small, you can scale it up uh, dynamically using the VPA. Again, it's based on historical resource utilization, uh, number of events, and it has three, three different components required. So there's a recommendation engine, uh, the updater, uh, which which is just a recommendation engine takes the metrics and says okay based on what I've seen in the past you should uh, in increase to this the updater is, is the part that actually does it themselves and then there's an administration uh, controller here and it looks something like this uh, coming into the verb this is then this is just regular Kubernetes nothing special that that we wrote but it's there we leverage it uh, the metric server the recommender again ties into the metric server looks at this looks at the different things that you've done what your memory consumption has been in the past. Uh, that monitors the pods, uh, then it makes a recommendation, sends it out to that VPA, and it says, okay, I uh, this this is what I want. I update the pods, and then I can override it with these different recommendations, right? So you can scale up. Uh, you don't have to guess exactly how much memory you need. You start getting a lot of uh, heat dumps, garbage collection pauses. The metrics server will indicate that, will, will detect that, and scale up your memory resources automatically uh, as well. These are the steps uh, to do it again, basically enable the metric server, enable the vertical pod autoscaler because uh, it uses that to collect the metrics. And then you enable it inside the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, right now, you, just, you know, it, it varies from that particular, it hasn't been integrated for my particular distribution of Kubernetes at home, which is micro K8. I run Ubuntu, so that one doesn't work on that one. So you'd have to, but it varies from your particular uh, Kubernetes distribution to another works on ranch or might work on the uh, you know different ones but didn't work on the one I had so I didn't didn't do it for the demo there but these are how you define again this is how you want to use it if you have a function and you want to say I want to do auto scaling vertically right so again this is great for use cases where you have to do uh, exactly one processing you're the only particular function that consume those messages in, in your particular architecture and you and enable it there, you can set up, again, your, make sure that those replicas are set. You set up your update mode to be automatic, and then you can specify different resource policies uh, based on containers, right? So you have granularity of control uh, on which ones you want to be able to trigger. And then you can have, like, this is my minimum allowed, and this is my maximum, right? So I want to have no, no less than 200 millicores, but no, don't exceed the core. I mean, even if you recommend more than that, this is sort of my upper bound on how many cores and how much memory I'm going to use with this particular Pulsar function. Uh, you can also uh, do this uh, as well if you want to do it just based on resource requests rather than recommendation. You want to bypass that and do it strictly on resource requests. You can enable this rather than having the VPA admin take control of it. Uh, or you can have it specify on particular resources. So if you want it to scale based on just memory or on CPU, again, these are the ones. Uh, or you can do both. This is the one where you can do both. It's an array. So you can pass in, uh, take the CPU metrics into account and scale those and take the memory uh, into that and scale my memory as well. So you can do one or the other or both for your vertical scaling capabilities. And with that, we'll do the demonstration 
uh, here, which I mentioned before, was sort of a, a recording because it requires a KA metric server to work. I couldn't get many cubes uh, micro uh, to work or the metric server to work on my particular laptop. Uh, so I did it on my home Kubernetes cluster and recorded it. And I want to dem it demonstrate the horizontal scale in of, of function pods from two to eight based on the CPU usage. Uh, I found it to be very hard to uh, generate a lot of load to CPU to trigger these things. It's an interesting uh, point that we'll have to build into our metric server that we really, what you really want to do is sort of, what, I, what I'd what i hoped it would do is figure out I'm this far behind in backlog and then start processing the messages. But what it actually does, like you can't put a pause in there, right? Say, take a message, think about it for 30 seconds, simulate I'm taking a lot of time. You actually have to chew up a lot of cores. So I'd write some, uh, do some interesting things to compute prime numbers in a weird way and these other computationally intense resources to trigger it. And I can share the code with you in a bit, but it really does trigger on the CPUs and then it scales up from four to eight. Uh, and also, I don't know if I ended recording that, but it also scales back down because the scale to zero problem is very hard. We auto scale our brokers, for example, in Pulsar, they can scale up dynamically, but then like, that's like, great. How do you know when to scale them back down? That's a harder problem to solve. Uh, it's always easy to just throw more resources at something, but this one in this case scales back down once the metrics get below that particular uh, volume as well. So that's what's going to show the scalability of this particular thing. And I hope if I can click on the stupid recording, and we can listen to these things here. So let's take a look at some of the code we're going to use to exercise this horizontal and vertical pot auto scaling for pulsar functions. So I've written this class called Fixed Work Simulator that allows you to dynamically produce and run a, a fixed workload when every message comes in. And you can have it controlled by different strategies, one for doing very CPU intensive workloads and another for doing memory intensive workloads to simulate the corresponding strategy to get the sort of trigger that, that we need. So again, this is passed in and it's configurable from here and there's different strategies. So, so the one we're going to use for CPU is called Fine Primes. This here basically has a thread pool. We're going to launch multiple threads, uh, one after another, with a little a bit of sleep in between to sort of ramp up the workload. Uh, and the task is going to be this internal task, which picks a random number uh, greater than 500,000 or maybe 400,000 here. And then just does a very expensive loop. As you can see, we pick a random number. And then we go through this loop, loop inside a loop. And this is a very CPU intensive. Uh, process. It's a fixed workload size. It's going to chew up a lot of CPU, which with a goal to trigger the auto scaling event uh, because we have a large number of CPU cycles going on. And again, we'll run multiple of the instances of these in parallel, and that'll get us the workload that we need. There's also one for memory. We're not going to use it here, but if you want to play with this later, it's also one very similar pattern. Uh, this one, I'm going to do it uh, all at once. We spin up the load, we do a random string sorter we run multiple copies of this to sort of consume the heap and trigger a memory uh, usage scenario again this random string sorter just goes through and uses the random strings utility uh, to generate uh, strings of, of a thousand characters each fifty thousand of them by default picking a random again a random number or here you do fifty thousand we do them a thousand length of a thousand each and that's going to create a very large data structure, we're putting them inside of a list. Here we just have a list, an array list of these strings to hold them. So we're going to make a very large memory footprint. And then that should trigger a large memory foot uh, auto scaling event corresponding with that. So those are, that's the code. I've written uh, deployment models here. So the one we're going to use is for the horizontal pod auto scaling at 80 CPU. Uh, again, we're using the function mesh declaration here. To Deploying the single function. It's the work fixed work simulator we just discussed. I am as part of the build file, I'm publishing this Docker image to a local Docker repo. Uh, we'll walk through that in the palm file here, palm file here in a bit. Uh, just have a, a data in topic. And here's the key we talked about the pod. We're gonna have the built-in autoscaler and specify the average utilization for CPU at 80%. Start out with very low, low resource limit or requests, much larger limits. And then we're going to have the, the jar file available, uh, pointed to my local dev cluster, my work home lab here, 
uh, URLs. So that's really it. I'm just walking through a little bit through the Palm Build file. Nothing really special here. Using the NAR file to build it. Once the NAR artifact has been built, I'm using the Fabricate Maven plugin to generate the image itself using the source main Docker file. So this has this Docker file. I can control whatever happens in here. I just copy over the artifact and change permissions. I specify we're using the functions Java as our base image, and then we're adding the repo to it here. And that's what this does. We build it, create the artifact, tag it with the latest tag, publish it to our Docker repo, which again is my local one. And then when we're doing the package phase of the build, make a build, it will do a Docker build as well, and it will push it uh, to that repo and give us the latest image on that. So that's really uh, it for that. Now let's go here to the image and see oops. that again, those deployments are there. So we'll go ahead and deploy this shortly. Uh, first, I just want to show that we're going to do uh, this is that, that's where I'm going to deploy them to. Nothing is running there. So we will do. It's out a little bit so you can read it. Use the correct term now. Apply. You can see it created the deployment. I will go back here and see what's available, and we'll see that as we specified in the file that there's exactly two replicas. As we specified zero, one, and two, they're up and running. You can also see that the auto scaler is there with a target of eighty percent. There are no metrics now because nothing is running. Maximum pods are set to eight as configured. Everything is up and running. Everything is good. So now let's do a cube cuddle. Right in. Into one of the brokers, because I can run one of the commands locally and generate this load. Use a Pulsar client for this because we only really need one message to trigger the produce. Dash n one. It doesn't really matter what. Public default. Get it in topic. Again, this is going to publish one message, which will trigger this function down here to run. So we can see that the CPU has now gone to 45, so nothing has changed. Um, the first first workload is running 45. Shortly, as we saw, there's going to be another uh, thread running that exact same process in parallel, which will trigger change to dynamics. So let's go ahead and look at this again. See, now we can see uh, 195% of CPU is used, which triggered a scaling event. In this case, we scaled two more. These were created within the last eight seconds. Now there's four of them running total. You can see the first two was created earlier. Now these two, let's do a clear. Let's see now if we've added another process that's come along. Uh, again, we've, we're scaling in these threads. So now that the CPU has gone up to 357 which triggered another auto scale event. And the last four, these four were generated uh, shortly thereafter. So again, this last batch is triggered to be the horizontal pod auto scaling uh, because of the workload being there. Uh, that's, that's really it. That's what I wanted to show you. Hopefully I can do the next one. 
So hopefully everybody was able to hear and see that demo and hear it. So just in summary, uh, I know we're a little bit earlier, but event-driven architectures are really just, you know, the new new and latest thing. It's really a more logical way to design applications. People are looking for a way to do that. Um, you know, and I think Pulsar is a natural fit because it's really the only horizontal, horizontal scalable solution that supports PubSub messaging uh, out of the box. Uh, built on top of that are Pulsar functions, which natively support uh, an event-driven programming model. The event comes in, you can do whatever processing language, language you want. Again, you can incorporate, I didn't show that here, but you can incorporate any sort of third-party library you want to do really, really complex things. Uh, any sort of in-stream processing, transformations, lookups, things like that, it's really up to you. You're only limited by what you can write uh, in, you know, with your SDK of choice. Again, Java, Python, Go, I'll give you a lot of different options. Uh, we then leverage the Pulsar run, uh, use the Pulsar functions, leverage the Kubernetes runtime to get you the resiliency you want. The pods can run automatically. A function mesh allows you to group them all together as a logical application. You define them very easily in a CRCD. Uh, and then individually, you can specify them to auto scale either vertically or horizontally based on what, what your needs are. That way, your, your systems will dynamically, elastically scale up to meet the demands, scale back down. I, I sort of preemptively ended that recording early, but uh, after that one message goes through and it processes it down, uh, actually the functions go back down to two. So it actually does scale both ways. Uh, the code is available, but you can test it yourself. It's very easy to use. Uh, that's it. Uh, very brief uh, thing today. Again, my details want to get in touch with me. Any questions on what you what you saw or questions in general about anything I've covered? Yes, sir. The vertical, vertical, sort of scaling. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you will start at you start at some point. Yep. So the question is for if you choose to use a vertical auto scaling function, will the will the function pods get restarted? My understanding is yes, they'll have to re, uh, reclaim more resources, but I was unable to demo that on my lab because of the limitation of my Kubernetes distribution. That is my understanding, uh, but I could be wrong. I'd be I'd be happy if it was not the case, but that's my understanding is how it gets done. Yes. Question in the back. Yes. The question is, is there a one-to-one -one relationship between functions and pods? That is yes. The answer is yes. So each function is its own individual piece of code. The function mesh is what allows you to have five pods with five different functions all elastic differently. And that way you can do a, a horizontal scaling for one of them, vertical for two others, and none for the third, if that's your choice. Yes. Great question. Yes. Um, in the software function, can only be famous function or auto state or something? Like, what is the, uh, what's the benefit of using the Pulsar function against the like Spark or Spring? Uh, so the question was, are, are Pulsar functions limited to stateless uh, processing only versus stateful and how how they accommodate for some of the things that more distributed processing systems handle? Uh, a, lot of, a lot of answers, I'll put it this way. Pulsar functions were designed to fit a niche need that things like Spark and Flink do well, which is the stateful processing, checkpointing, things like that. Uh, we found that most of the stream, a lot of a lot of stream processing functions are very simple transformations, lookups, and things like that to make it easy to use. Uh, having said that, we there is a stateful, there's a state store part of functions. You can sort of store state uh, inside a, a function and then retrieve it later on. And we also support windowing, which is a bit of stateful. So you can say, I want this function to run over a X amount of events or X amount of time of events, and it buffers up those messages, and then you can do some analytics on that as well. So it's kind of stateful, but there is no checkpointing on that. It was designed to solve a slightly different use case in that regard, the per event messaging transforms versus uh, more stateful, no no stream joining, uh, not a lot of state retention and things like that. Does it mean like you cannot restore the previous state if you like uh, fails the so the question was, how, uh, are you able to restore state or something like that? So in a use case like that, if you're using Pulsar functions, so let's say an event-driven architecture, you'd want to use an event store concept behind the scenes. Uh, and then it can go back and if, if your data retention policies are set, we talked about earlier, all the data is there, you can uh, pre-read that data and rebuild your state using an a, a, a event-based model. But that would be the way. There's no checkpointing that you do in other systems. Yes. Dave, yes. Question? Uh, yes. Um... So where does one find the spells if it's not part of Apache Pulsar? This is uh, stream data. This is under the uh, function meshes under the Kubernetes uh, deployment under that particular 
um, model and licensing right now that's available there. It's open source in that regard, but it's open, completely open source. Uh, if you go to the uh, Cloud Native Foundation, it is there. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair point. This is the patch you want, so you called me. Yeah. Is there one last question? All right. Let's thank our speakers.